Hey guys, this is Robert Breedlove from the What Is Money Show. And as you've learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to facilitate financial security for all. They accomplish this by bringing a high level of professionalization and sophistication to the Bitcoin marketplace. As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward thinking individuals and institutions alike. By using Nidig, you will gain access to an end to end institutional grade platform providing Bitcoin OTC transactions, Bitcoin collateralized borrowing, secure custody, asset management, derivatives, financing, market research, and more. And all of these services meet the highest regulatory, governance, and audit standards. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yin Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and is leading the way for ongoing institutional adoption in this nascent asset class. So please be sure to check out Nidig as a single source for all your Bitcoin needs. Well, that, and this, so that gets us into you know, the rise of the U.S. and things were going well here for a while until we erupted into our own civil war. Mm. And this particular chapter in your book, I know you mentioned, you said more people write you about this chapter than anyone else. I thought it was just super interesting. Um, I am very biased though. As I mentioned to you before the show, I grew up in Tennessee. My uncle used to collect civil war artifacts like bullets and all of these things. He's big into metal detecting. So I, I grew up, around these stories and a lot of the places i lived in chattanooga which is a city right on the tennessee georgia line they're named after civil war events you know there's like battleground parkway um the um everything like there's signs about how this land everywhere you go in the city this particular land was the site of some pivotal battle in the civil war like a lot of it was was fought in i think virginia and tennessee were the states that it was mostly fought in yeah and all um, in the, it's almost all in the south yes and the, the, the south wasn't trying to invade the north or conquer the north that's right <laughs> so we were trying to peacefully succeed essentially and your book makes the great point that it was the the south was basically benefiting from a lot of economic prosperity right we're producing a lot of things but cotton i guess was the the main export and tobacco uh, and tobacco and so we were serving essentially as the tax base upholding the rest of the country i think mm -hmm. um i think you said 75 percent of maybe the ta total tax revenues in the entire country were coming from the south despite the population in the north being more than twice as much as the south so we we're one third the population, but we we're paying three quarters of the taxes, something to that effect. At one point, it was something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and we really just wanted to succeed because of that of that reason to protect our own economic interests. And we didn't want to go to war with the North because we were outnumbered and they had uh, all the industrial advantages. You couldn't wait. You couldn't beat the North in a war. All you could do was hold them off for long enough until they gave up. Yeah. So this whole narrative, which is pumped into us in government school systems that the north and lincoln was this noble guy that came down here to end slavery and free all the slaves and the evil slave masters in the south wanted to go and you know fight to keep their slaves it's a bogus narrative frankly i think so and you know i'm not sure most americans want to be challenged and told their history by a bloke with an accent like mine but nevertheless <laughs> You know, this was a book about taxation, and I was looking at the um, history of the world through this new prism of taxation. That's the central theory of the book. You can take any great event, and if you'll find an untold tax story, mm -hmm. without which that event would have unfolded in a very different way. And I started the chapter on the U.S. Civil War ended up becoming the longest chapter in the book, and and it's half of what it was in the original draft. Mm. But it just the more I started digging into it, I was like, how does nobody know this stuff? And so you know, I'm sure I could sit down with a with a on a TV program with a with a Civil War historian, and he'd destroy me in an argument because he'd just have much more 
recall and knowledge of the documents at the time. Mm. But I stand by my original theories. When you start to look at through things through this prism of taxation, events suddenly make sense in a way that they never did before. Right. And the US Civil War is no different. And as a starting point, I want you to tell me what what is the prevailing narrative? What were you taught about the Civil War when you were at school? I would say roughly that there was slavery in the South, not in the North. There was some type of moral divide roughly between the two and that Abraham Lincoln was the hero that, you know, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, I think that was like, and again, I'm not recalling these facts uh, chronologically as they're maybe taught in school, but just the general thesis of the narrative was that the Emancipation Proclamation was held or he gave the speech and that like set the battleground and um the south just was the obstinate resistant of the two they wanted to keep the slavery you know slavery was so important to their economy and the north had this moral high ground that they wanted to to liberate the slaves so they went to war that's the rough narrative that i got going to so public school in tennessee so going so the, the the majority of Americans are taught that the North went to war to liberate the sla the slaves of the South to, mm -hmm. to to end slavery. That was the reason that the North went to war. Mm. Yes, I, I I just find that extraordinary. Yeah, because that narrative doesn't even tie with the events as they took place at the time. Right, because. Um, you know, you can start with Lincoln when he was elected, said, I'm just turning to the right page. Uh, so Lincoln, when he was elected, said in his inaugural address, I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. So he said that mm -hmm. quite clearly. Yeah. And America went to war in what, 1861? Was it 1862? And the Emancipation of Slavery Act didn't come until I think 1863. Right. When at that stage, the war wasn't going that well for the Northern states. Right. And the purpose of the Emancipation Act was that was to create civil discord within the Southern states, right? So to drain the resources of the Southern armies, so that they had to deal with internal um, civil strife, and they would have less resources to allocate to their borders and to fighting the wars. Right. That was the from a military strategic point of view. And so that's the first two things. And the Southern states, the moment they knew in November 18, uh, I get my years muddled up. Was it 1860 or 1859 that Lincoln actually won the election? Uh, he said the November 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected president. Okay, so 1861, he actually became president yeah so in november the 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 in november 1860 as soon as they knew lincoln was becoming president south carolina and a couple of other states seceded mm -hmm. and they did not have the support of all the other states and it was only after lincoln the shots were fired at sumter and mm -hmm. lincoln actually went to war that I think Virginia and maybe even Tennessee decided they were on the side of the Southern states. Right. So it was only when bullets were fired. And up until that point, you know, there'd been a Congress in Virginia and they'd all voted in favor of, of staying in the Union. But when it was clear that Lincoln was going to use force against the Confederacy, new votes were held and yep. then they voted in favor of secession. Yeah. And but they were. When Lincoln turned violent. They were. They were uh, the tariff that the South was opposed to was being reduced. And so they were basically cooperating on that premise. Yeah. 
Well, we'll come to the tariff in a moment, Robert. Oh, but okay. the, 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 the only thing I was just outlining to you there was the sequence of events around the actual slavery thing. Mm -hmm. Like that, that, the timing of that is inaccurate. And, right. you know, if they were so intent on getting rid of slavery, why did they just replace it with segregation? Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it's it's a classic case of history being written by the victors. Yeah, the victors want to claim the moral high ground, right? And so then then the, this narrative being put on after the event, and then the the argument gets ah well the southern states fired the first shot at Sumter. The yeah. first yeah. shot was fired by the southern states, but you know Lincoln they for 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 considerable time. Lincoln knew that shots fired at Sumter could trigger a war, and and the Southern states had been been trying to get the um, the uh, uh, the Northerners out of Sumter for some considerable right. time, um, but Lincoln wouldn't remove him because he was worried. He, his words was, "What about the revenue?" That's right. That's where they were and collecting the revenue. Out. Yeah, and they did that, and then and then it was the supply ships coming in. But they already were being supplied. There's a qu quite um, famous interview that Lincoln held with a chap called Major Baldwin, and he and and um, the people of Charleston had been feeding the people at Sumter. They didn't know that need the supply ships, so the supply ships was just a provocation. And when the first bullet was eventually um, fired, Lincoln said the plan succeeded. They attacked Sumter. It fell and thus did more service than it otherwise could. Lincoln needed the Confederates to fire the first shot because then he had the justification. You know, he thought like a solicitor. He thought like a lawyer. Um, and then once the first shot was fired, he had the justification to act like he did. Right. But, but he was provoking them. Now, so that's that's just attacking that narrative about the slavery but i just want to come to the tax thing now and the there had already been an attempt to secede in the 1830s there was there had already been one attempt and it had nothing to do with slavery it had everything to do with taxes and eventually it was resolved henry clay who was very pro tariff and um what was his name the the, the uh, southern states guy who was this was in another john c calhoun mm. uh and henry clay and they averted secession and this was in the 1830s or was it early 1840 and then in if again just um on the issue of of secession again um in there was a um, an election in 1851 in South Carolina, which was um, to do with the protecting the prosperity of the cotton producers. And it was essentially a referendum on secession. And at this stage, the Southern states were paying um, a very a, a, a respectable rate of taxation. And the secessionists got absolutely walloped. The cooperationists won almost 60% of the vote. So the slavery issue alone wasn't enough to drive even South Carolina, which was the most separatist of the states, mm -hmm. let alone the other states as a succession, especially when business good. And this was in the early 1850s when the economy was booming. The South had few complaints, but that all changed after the financial crisis of 1857. Um, and or it, was, it was known as the panic of 1857. Mm. So, Let's just go back a bit. We'll backtrack a bit and we'll go all the way back to um, there was a war between England and the United States in 1812 and it went on all the way to 1816. And um, the uh, uh, Americans won. The English got to, had to go and fight Napoleon, basically. I think it was known as the War of 1812 and it went on for three or four years. Yeah. But it showed to the American authorities that they were very badly prepared because they were totally dependent on English imported goods. Mm. 
And so it was decided that more investment was needed in industrial goods in the northern states so that um, the America wouldn't be caught short again and it was self-sufficient. And so they introduced this Dallas tariff named after the um, Treasury Secretary of the time in 1816. And the northern state, uh, the southern states were on board with it. And it basically played a large, puts a large tariff on um, uh, imported goods. Now, it was, the, it was South Carolina and the southern states that imported most of the goods from Europe, especially from England, and they sold cotton in exchange. And they would import, you know, farming goods, nails, hammers, plows, all this kind of thing. And um, it was an effective trade. And, and they agreed to this tariff because the southern states agreed that northern industry needed some protection, it needed right. some investment, and the investment for come, come from them. The northern states did so well out of it that in 1820, the southern states, no, we're not paying the tariff anymore. And the northern states said, no, no, we're going to carry on paying it. And this uh, the northern states won. They had sway in Congress and they won the, the, the votes they needed to sway. And so suddenly for the next 30 or 40 years, the southern states suddenly found themselves paying a hugely disproportionate um, uh, amount of, of federal taxes at the tax level. And as you said at the beginning, at one point, I think it was actually over 75% of federal taxes were coming from the southern states. At one point, I think it was even in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And you know, there were times when it came back and there were times when it went up. And eventually by the 1830s, the Southern states said, and this sort of loyalty to the United States that exists now wasn't there then. You know, mm. it was much more about individual states. The United States as a country was a you know relatively new thing. And the Southern states in the 1830s said, no, we, we're we not having this anymore. We want to secede. And then Clay and, and Calhoun agreed that tariffs would come down over the next 20 or 30 years. And they did. But Lincoln was elected very much on a protectionist tariff. He was, uh, you know, he won key swing states, Pennsylvania especially, promising to protect their industry. Mm -hmm. So, and he, I don't think Lincoln got a single um, seat in the South. I don't think he got one. Right. Because all the Southern states knew that the election of Lincoln meant higher taxes for them. And so when he was elected, they grant, began to succeed, secede. And Lincoln's first thing he would always say is, I am going to war to protect the Union. That was his thing. I'm protecting the Union. That was the message that he gave out. But, you know, as we know from this, from the book, tax is power, tax is control. Mm -hmm. Without the Union, without the Southern states, he loses his tax revenue. Mm -hmm. The last thing the Union wanted was a, a low tax, nimble, free trading. You know, does New York really want all the Southern states suddenly occupying all the free trade with Europe and cutting them out? Nobody wanted it. And so Lincoln went to war to protect the Union, to save the Union. But by that, you can infer that as to save Union tax revenue. Right, so I make right. the argument and I, that, that, that the Americans, you know, I'm not pretending slavery wasn't an issue because it was a huge issue and it was, um, the Southern states depended on it and the Northern states, it was, it had already been made illegal in mm -hmm. practice, although not in theory in 1804. But when, um, uh, I'll, I'll carry on talking just a tiny bit more and then I'll give you, I'll hand it back to you, Robert. But when Lincoln was elected, he had said that he had no purpose to impose slavery bans in the South. The Supreme Court had also given its endorsement three years earlier, when in 1857 it ruled against Dred Scott, who was a former slave who um, tried to sue for his and his family's freedom, and the Supreme Court ruled, ruled against him. And Congress had offered the South constitutional amendments that protected protected it from federal government's interference in slavery. So the three main arms of US power had all said, you will keep your slavery, and still the South wanted secession. Why? So maybe they didn't believe them. And they, there was all sorts, in their various proclamations, there was all sorts of, we want to protect slavery. And, you know, slavery was essential to the business model of the South. But mm -hmm. as it turned out, you know, with the, with the agriculture and so on, but as it turned out with improved machinery, slavery would have, you know, we talked about, you know, the, the, the guy doing the fans being replaced by, you know, machines yeah. would have 
put an end to slavery within probably two or three decades anyway. Right. Um, and the war accelerated the process. But the idea that the North, which had, you know, the South wanted independence. It wanted to protect its own slavery, but it also wanted to protect its economic interests. It wanted protection from these, these onerous taxes, which it hadn't voted for. Uh, that were taking its wealth and it hadn't voted for, and they were being spent, the taxes were taken from the South and spent in the North. You know, it wanted its own sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So all these reasons. And then we, if you read the, um, uh, the address of the people of South Carolina, it read, the people of the Southern states are not only taxed for the benefit of the Northern states, but after the taxes are collected, three fourths of them are expended in the North. This has made the cities of the South provincial. Their growth is paralyzed. They are more, they are mere suburbs of Northern cities. Mm. There, you know, is a key reason why the South wanted secession. And then you learn that I think in 1864, it sent a delegation to um, the United Kingdom. And it said, if you recognize the Confederate States as an independent nation, we will make slavery illegal. Mm. So it's, it shows that independence was more important to them than slavery. Right. Now, I'm not defending the institution of slavery for a second or any such. I'm merely challenging the narrative that northern states, and especially Lincoln, were these especially holy guys. You know, I don't believe how many people were killed in the U.S. Civil War. Is it several million? Um, it must have been. Have they really prepared to die for something like slavery at the time, which at the time, in the context of the morals of the time, was not perceived in the same way it is today? Right. I just don't believe they were. And so, you know, the real reason was Lincoln went to war to protect union tax revenue. And, you know, taxation is control. He went to protect union power, union control. Mm -hmm. No, I'm... Brilliant analysis and a refreshingly realistic perspective. And again, is is reinforcing this point that it's economic reality or technological reality that underpins morality. Like a morality emerges from economic realities. But to your point, it's the North being the victor in this battle just tries to rewrite it the other way, saying that, no, we had the yeah. superior moral high ground. And so we imposed, uh, you know, our benefit <laughs> there. They were trying to position themselves as a benefactor, I guess, to humanity yeah. in some way as uh, this liberating force. But they it's all just, it, it's to justify as moral something that actually really wasn't that moral. It's immoral. That's right. That's right. It's it's like a moralistic camouflage almost, mm. which is very common uh, with government, right? This is uh, this is Marxism, right? From each according to their ability to each according to their need. It's this beautiful moral container for the most immoral system that ever existed. And this idea, like to, in my mind, it's not even arguable because for war is such an economically expensive enterprise. There has to be the prospect of gain that is motivating it. It can never be just some pure moralist, moralistic or ideological contention. There ha it has to be rooted in economic reality. Otherwise, you can't wage the war. You can't afford it, right? There's no, there's no benefit for the cost, potential benefit for the cost you are incurring. So it just doesn't make any sense in my mind that uh, yeah. I can't I couldn't see it any, any other way, frankly. The purpose of every conquest in history is to take control of the tax base, the land, the labor, the produce, the profits. That's right. But, and and you know, that that the American Civil War wasn't a conquest, but in a way it was. Yes. It was preventing secession. Now, you know, it's it must be the most it is the most discussed and disputed and argued and written about event in American history, the American mm -hmm. Civil War. Yeah. And I'm sure most Americans, you know, despite they're taught this whole narrative, I bet there's a part of them that just goes, is that really right? Yeah, that doesn't quite. There's always this lingering thing. It doesn't go it doesn't quite ring right to me. Yeah, and I'm sure this exists, and that's why the thing keeps one of the, well, one of the reasons why it keeps being discussed and disputed because people are going, eh, it doesn't. It? And then yes. once you look at it through this perspective about it was main, about maintaining control, it was about maintaining tax. People were fighting basically for their economic interests. Right. So suddenly you go. Oh yeah! Suddenly, it makes a lot more sense. Yes, you know, yes. Southern states did want to keep the uh, 
the um, uh, institution of slavery and the northern states were less bothered about it because the southern states were dependent on it for their economy in the way that the northern states weren't because they weren't dependent on slaves working in the fields in the way that the northern states weren't and so they had all the the factory workers you know could be done by you know white slaves effectively or indentured yeah. servants or whatever who were like half a notch up from the black slaves right so you know, it was, it was, once you start looking at you, you look at the incentives, you always use that word yeah. and the economic interests of the relative parties. And suddenly the thing makes a lot more sense. Uh, and, uh, and I feel quite sorry for people from the Southern States because for 150 years, they've been, you know, educated to believe that they're somehow evil and immoral. And I think mm -hmm. you, you notice when you go to a lot of those States in America, there's a lack of confidence that you don't find in other American States. And I'm sure it all boils down to this misinformation. Yeah. It's interesting, man. I, yeah, I, I wonder what the cultural, um, echoes have been from that, but it, this to me, this is one of my paradigm. This is a paradigm that I have is that what I say, I say that money is the means and ends of all warfare. What you're describing is you would say taxation, perhaps, where mm -hmm. taxation is power. And I just am, uh, I agree completely. This is like to, to tax is to extract the money essentially, right? So you need money to go to war. You have to finance this, the most expensive enterprise in, in uh, the sphere of human action. And you also go to war with the aim of profit, basically obtaining more money than you spent going into it. But there's, it's almost always that. I mean, I, I, I don't know of a historical example where it's not that. Like you go to war to get stuff from people, whether you're trying to get food, yeah. territory, whatever it may be, it's, it comes down to the money. The one example that I can think of that maybe that doesn't apply is World War II. Mm. I mean, you know, Hitler went to war to conquer Europe for sure. And he's raiding gold right. hordes, right? As he conquers. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Hundred Hitler went yeah. to war for, for gold and power and, yeah. and all the things that come with it. And I suppose R Russia and England initially went to war with Hitler to stop him doing that. Mm -hmm. Now Russia was in the front line a lot more than England was, than Britain was. Yes. So uh, Britain, I suppose, didn't really need to get involved unless it really needed to. Mm. But then again, I guess it was in Britain's strategic interests to maintain the power structure in a particular way in, in Europe. And that justified, you know, I mean, it, Britain had been getting involved in wars in, in Europe ever since forever, you know, so right. it was nothing new. But that's the one war, the British involvement in World War II, where you could say, actually, maybe personal gain wasn't the reason they did it. Tell me if um, if but this the, is the irony is the World War Two, British won. That's like the first major war in history where the British didn't get massive spoils from the conquered country, right? In a way that previous wars resulted in, and that's why Germany was able to come back post-war much quicker than Britain did. Yeah, uh, here was my another read I had on that was when Germany invaded Poland and they raided the central bank. They 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 looted their gold. Mm -hmm. I thought at that time, Britain took that as a pretty distinct signal that they needed to defend themselves. So Maybe. they were, they were defending their interests. And that's around the time that a lot of gold in Europe started to head to North America. Mm. A lot of it was being shipped to North America as like a geographic safe haven. Mm. And then I think that ultimately incentivized the United States entry into World War II, right? We had all the gold here. We could now go in, end the war rewrite the banking rules to our favor and say, yeah. all right, we're now the, the reserve currency pegged to gold. You all are pegged to us. So even at that highest geopolitical level, we're sort of fighting over the money. Yeah. The other thing was obviously Pearl Harbor. Yeah. 10 years of depression. Yeah. We need something to get things going here. Yeah. You know, maybe it was, it was, uh, I mean, Roosevelt tried to stay out of it, but he couldn't after Pearl Harbor, I suppose. But yeah, you no, know, there was um, there was um, by the time Pearl Harbor happened, I guess it was a war that they weren't that they could see could fix a lot of domestic problems. Right. Yeah. It's, hmm. 
It's a very, very interesting lens. Uh, so bringing it back to the Civil War, yeah, this war in Europe that you mentioned actually had a lot of impact because there was a lot of demand. I think Europe was at, I forget who Europe was at war with, but there's a big demand for American exports. So we were sending a lot of, I guess, cotton food, or I guess cotton and tobacco maybe to Europe. But then when that war ceased, it, it decreased demand for American exports. So that further put the hurt on the South. So they were getting these tariffs and their exports had collapsed. Um, and so that was, that was contributing to this desire to secede. Yeah. On a relative basis, the Southern States never really recovered, did they? Yeah. You know, the wealth of the wealth of the South, the great agricultural wealth of the South on a relative, you know, the, it was the North, Northern industry became the, the big growth mm -hmm. area right, in the, in the second half of the 19th century. And it probably would have done anyway without the war. Yeah. And the subsidies and the tariffs and everything else. And, um, you know, maybe it would have been better for American industry not to be protected and that would have forced it to up its game, you know? Right. Uh, yeah. Well, that's what I would believe. You said that the iron, the, the taxes were outrageous. Nail, iron was very heavily taxed. Nails were taxed at over 100%. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Um, and then looking at the... And the English hated it as well. Yeah. Because their exports became less competitive than, uh, you know, competing with Northern... You know, because if you think, you know, South Carolina is a Britain, it's a pretty straight route. It's a pretty obvious trade route. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what's it got to do with the North? <laughs> right. South Carolina wants to sell things to the British and the British want to sell things to South Carolina. What's the problem? Yeah. And uh, but the North wasn't having it. And this was, this was uh, a resurgence of the idea of taxation without representation, right? Southerners started looking at mm -hmm. the North as indistinguishable from the tyranny of Great Britain, you know, not so many years before. They viewed themselves in the same way that the, that they were exactly that they viewed themselves in the same way that the uh, American revolutionaries had, you know, 80, 80 years earlier. And this, and this really blew my mind because I didn't know this, but looking at the Confederate States constitution, it was mo modeled after the U S constitution, mm -hmm. except that it actually had even more decentralized sovereignty, even more constraints and const restrictions on the federal the ability of the federal government to collect taxes. So it was, it was uh, a more decentralized governance model. You could say it's more U.S. Constitution than the original U.S. Constitution. I, I 100%. In fact, it's, uh, it, it's probably a better, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful constitution. It was, yeah. It's probably a better constitution to have now, you know. This, so this pattern. There's some like, stuff about slavery in it, but basically it made rule local rather than central than yeah. central there just seems to be this recurrent pattern where each time a society attempts to force it banned the slave trade with africa as well yeah and they banned the slave trade they didn't they didn't um uh oh but there was there was some hypocritical because the one thing they didn't do is they they prevented states from abolishing slavery within their own borders right that was the one area where individual states rights weren't sovereign Right. So that was a, yeah, 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 maybe yeah, not right. quite so good on that one, but, yeah. Uh, but, um, yeah. But so this, this recurrent pattern of every time a society forks these ideas that are getting refined over time, like about individual liberty or property rights, they sort of get refined a little bit further in the next formative document in a way where we keep, the tendency of sovereignty has been to decentralize over time. So I just thought that was interesting that even this document that never, you know, never succeeded was still like that. It was still an iteration. It was like a V2 on the American constitution. Mm. It was, it was, yeah, that's exactly what it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I guess you could talk about, yeah, you said Lincoln coaxed us into firing the first shots. Um, he was an attorney, right? Lincoln. Yeah. Yeah, so of course he was playing to oh, your point. He was, a, he was a wily politician, right? He's playing the game correctly. And then he established the IRS and the US yeah. global tax system. And, and he gave America its first income tax. Right. 
a temporary measure, I'm sure. Uh, well, it was, I think he introduced it either 61 or 62. And I think it was abolished again in 75, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, they brought it back in 1913. Oh, um, right in line with the Fed. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And by the way, it was income tax that gave America prohibition. Really? If you hadn't introduced income tax in 1913, you would never have had prohibition. Because the guy who was the main campaigner, Wayne Wheeler was his name. Um, it was a formidable campaigner. And, you know, he coined the term pressure groups. Yeah. And he would turn on any politician that didn't support him. Uh, it didn't matter. And he formed these weird alliances like, you know, the Ku Klux Klan supported him and all these Catholic and uh, Jewish and Italian, um, you know, who were uh, the opposite to what the Ku Klux Klan wanted all supported him as well. He just formed these amazingly weird alliances all under this one issue of we must make alcohol illegal. And but the one barrier was, is that the American federal, at the federal level, America, America was too dependent on alcohol taxes. And so there was no way, if America made alcohol illegal, there was no way that, um, that the federal government could support itself. Yeah. And then, so Wheeler realized this. And so he campaigned like mad for income tax. You've got to have income tax. You've got to have income tax. You've got to have income tax. And eventually got his way and income tax was introduced. And then he turned around and said, yeah, you've got income tax. Now you can make alcohol illegal. Wow. Interesting. And so why, why, what, why did he want to make alcohol illegal though? What was his? Well, he, his was a, it was a personal mission. Oh, it was a personal mission. Graham. He, 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 I think he'd got stabbed in the leg by a, he worked, he grew up on a farm and there'd been a farmhand who was drunk, who'd stabbed him accidentally in the leg with a pitchfork. Mm. So he just grew up with a lifelong loathing of alcohol. Gotcha. And he was just, it was just his life's mission to force temperance on everyone else. Wow. Interesting. And then when World War I came, you know, income tax came, then World War I came and he really attacked all the German brewers of which there were loads in America and like, you know, oh, look, they're German, 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 alcohol, German, German, alcohol. Mm. And that was another big uh, <laughs> thing in his, uh, in his campaigning. Interesting. Well, so that was, yeah, to quote, oh, and the, the, the South, I mean, we offered to peacefully secede even after the Civil War had started, right? We said we'd abolish slavery and just secede, but the North refused. Well, they sent was, a delegation to the UK. Ah, uh, to the that, UK, gotcha. If you recognize us. And then just uh, to, quote, to quote your book and put a button on it, you said that in a popular understanding of history, the Confederate cause has since been smeared while the union effort has been framed as some great and noble cause. In reality, both sides were fighting over their economic interests. That's it. And it's so, I mean, obvious in a way it's like, of course they're fighting over their economic interests. That's what, that's what humans fight over. Mm -hmm. But man, it is not, I don't think this narrative is, well understood at all in the United States today. It was no different to any other civil war or any other great revolt. Somewhere near its heart, there is always a tax story. Beautiful. Man, and, I, yeah, I will... You talked about tax and money. I, you know, in the Venn diagram, <laughs> there's a big crossover in the Venn diagram between the two. Yeah, you, I mean, or yeah, you need money to efficiently collect taxes, basically. Mm -hmm. And the you know, as we touched on way earlier and probably our first recording, the first written records were tax records, right? So it was yeah. people, it, whether it was in kind or in money, it didn't matter. They were, we were using a, using language to collect taxes. So. Um, I, how much of altcoin speculation, like you know, manias and bubbles and popular delusions and all those things, you know, a lot of the time there are consequences of fiat money. Mm -hmm. you know, they yeah. tend to occur at times when, when greed is at its most. And it's almost like dis the honesty of a, of an honest pound has gone from society. So people try and make easy money yeah. because money's too easy. How much of all coin speculation do you think is a consequence of fiat debasement? 
a significant portion. I think that there's this positive correlation between fiat currency inflation and the propensity to gamble. And you see that historically, that, that book I mentioned earlier, Fiat Currency Inflation in France, the more they, the more rapidly they increased the money supply, the more crazy gambling became. Uh, and there was a whole class of people um, that emerged around that, that they were just gambling on anything and everything. Uh, so yeah, I think it's, I think altcoins are just modern gambling devices. And for that reason, <laughs> We're probably likely to have a lot more waves of this mania in the coming mm -hmm. decade because we're going to have so much inflation. And how many, what percentage of people who invest in Bitcoin invest in it because they think they're going to get rich quick? And how, what percentage are uh, in it for some other reason? I think initially, probably almost everyone is drawn in for number go up, right? That's the marketing technology built into it, which is, hey, I'm going to put dollars in and take more dollars out. The percentage of people that convert, say people come for the profits, but the percentage of people that convert and stay for the principles, like of sound money, I, I would assume is much, much smaller, maybe 5%. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think initially everyone's drawn in by the, the economic incentive. There's nothing like uh, price confirms narrative. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's where the two touch in a free market, right? Where you have objective reality, supply, meeting narrative, demand. Mm -hmm. Whatever that, wherever they match, wherever they touch is the price. But, you know, if the price was falling every week, nobody would believe that Bitcoin is the money of the future. And they didn't. I was here. I was doing all the same things during the bear market. And people just thought I was some crazy guy with a Bitcoin yeah. tattoo. And now people pay attention. So it's, yeah, that's how it goes, man. <laughs> what does one get as a tattoo? I can't get an IRS tattoo. I want the opposite of the IRS tattoo. I guess I have to get an anarchist tattoo or something like that. That was my other thought is I've got the B on my right arm. I could get the A with a circle on the left arm, have the AB anarchy Bitcoin thing. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that, that's that symbol and that term is pretty ill understood. People think anarchy is lawlessness, but it's, it really yeah. means no rulers, anarchy, no archon, no ruler. Mm. Yeah. wonder how we change that narrative. Maybe if we just went back to no rulers. You just got to let technological reality do its thing, right? Yeah. Natural law. Yeah. Which, which is so interesting that looking at history in that way, it's, it makes you curious about what morality will look like on a Bitcoin standard. If Bitcoin succeeds, it changes our morality in the long run. Mm -hmm. Um, what percentage of Bitcoin do you think have been lost? I've read estimates of three to 4 million on 20 million coin. So that's what 15, 20%. Yeah. That's what I've read. Yeah. I reckon it might be higher. Yeah. I think Satoshi's stash is gone. I, either the keys are lost or maybe Satoshi as an individual, if he's an individual passed away. Well, if he's Dan Kleiman, he did pass away. Yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah, there's a million right there. And I'm sure there's at least another two to three million lost. Mm -hmm. I've got old wallets that if I went in them, I could get my Bitcoin gold and my Bitcoin cash and my Bitcoin. I just <laughs> I've got no idea how to do it. Yeah. I don't even know where the old wallets are. Are those, I mean, in Bitcoin gold, oh, I guess Bitcoin cash still has a market value. But. Bitcoin gold had a had a run, man. Ah, a couple like John Matonis was texting me, going, "Get find your old wallets, get your Bitcoin gold out. It's it's gone up." Huh. <laughs> Interesting. I pay so little attention to the altcoin market. Ah, uh, me too. Oh well, no, I I'm, I think I pay more attention than you. I got I've got a fondness for the privacy coins. Mm, so yeah, yeah, I do get some pushback on that as on the Bitcoin narrative. People tell me that Monero is equally decentralized and i know it's way more private so i don't know I, I don't know enough about it but my general understanding is that everything else is 
vulnerable to some type of unilateral attack, mm -hmm. whereas Bitcoin is just the most resistant asset to, to anything like that. Well, that's certainly true. Yeah, I like Monero because it is actually used to transact stuff. I like mm. Ethereum because it is actually used for stuff beyond speculate. You know, people do use it for to build apps on and for NFTs and whatever. Right. So, you know, they they are actually used. I like it. You know, no matter what their valuations are, if if, if a coin has demonstrable use, then 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 yeah. it has a reason to exist beyond just being a speculative asset in itself. Well, I actually consider the hodl a use you know i love holding an asset that i have a guaranteed fraction of a supply that nobody can violate mm. for me that is bitcoin's utility for now as it monetizes clearly if it accrues enough purchasing power at some point in your life you're probably you're gonna have enough unrealized gain built into your position you'll have an incentive to go out and spend but for me now it's just like i said it's a land grab i just want as much as possible Mm -hmm. What do you think about the fact that the early adopters are so dramatically favored? I suppose a, a lot of that is being compensated with, you know, loss, you know, by hacking or lose lost keys or whatever. Yeah. I mean, that's how it works. That's how money works. Frankly, if you figure out there's a great, there's a great quote, I think by Minger. And he says throughout history, you know, people are, trying to discover how saleable an item is. So everyone's trading with the idea of getting from A to B, essentially. Mm -hmm. And you'll, if you can trade your good for something that's slightly more tradable, it might not be what you're going for, then you, you're one step closer to getting the thing you ultimately desire. And through that process, something emerges as the most saleable good, which is money by definition. But he said, historically, is you know, different monies come in contact with one another. Certain groups of people figure out first that this thing, this good is more saleable than all other competing goods. So they always benefit disproportionately. It's the same thing like when gold uh, encounters silver in a trade network, like people that like China and India that tried to stay on a silver standard longer, they, lo they lost out in that trade. Whereas people that figured out gold was a better store value won out. So I don't, yeah. I don't, have any qualms about it um i think it's it's still a better system than central banking where it's there is no early adopter in central banking it's just whoever owns the printing press or has access to the the newly produced dollars can just rob everyone else whereas in bitcoin at least the rules are fixed it's like you may have got there first and have way more bitcoin than i'll ever have good for you hats off to you you figured it out first or maybe you got lucky whatever but at least I know the rules can't be violated to fuck me over later. Mm. I, I, see, I don't mind it as much as some people do, because again, you know, some people th think the early adoption thing is what makes it a Ponzi scheme or a pyramid, mm. but I, I think it, because it rewards bravery. Yes. Yeah, of course. It rewards those who dive in. And, you know, what about the guys looking for El Dorado or whatever it is, right. the, you know, the, or, or the, 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 um, the guys looking for the the gold in the gold rush in Nevada, you know, it's the guys who move earliest and biggest and bravest were often the ones who were rewarded the most. So absolutely, yeah, it's it's no different than going into a venture capital round, right? At the seed versus the A versus the B versus the C mm -hmm. round, you're you're taking it's being uh, the risk is being reduced at each successive funding round because the company is bigger, more successful, more established, whatever but the payoff is less asymmetric. So the guys that got in early, they were just in this, you know, quote unquote seed stage of Bitcoin and good for them. I kicked myself still that I was arguing on behalf of Bitcoin in 2014, but I wasn't buying more. I hadn't seen the light, so to speak. I wrote the bloody book about it and I had my coins stolen, but <laughs> you know, to, don't talk to me about it. Anyway. We've, we've all got our painful good, stories. Because, uh, it's it means I I keep working and humankind benefits from my endeavor and my hard work. There's the silver lining right there. Well, Dominic, this your book is incredible, man. Um, I hope everyone will go out and get it again. It's called Daylight Robbery. Um, I Thank you know you. it's just this whole you know as you know this show it's called the What Is Money Show. 
I think this is just another branch to that rabbit hole for me. It's like, okay, yeah, it's a lot, a lot about the money, but the thing that money exists for, the reason money exists, frankly, is for taxation almost. Like they sort of co-evolved together. And taxation has just shaped the entire world. So your book, I think, just brilliantly laid that out for me, and it's given me new, new insights into history. And, and for that, I thank you. Well, thank you very much, Robert. And and I will say this, I've been, I discovered the evils of fiat money, if you like, in 2005. Mm. And I've been reading about it. I've been writing about it. I've been investing based on it. I've been thinking about it. I've been doing podcasts. I've been making films. It's been like the subject that's most important to me for a long, long time. And you know, my first book, Life After the State, I was like, if we're going to save society, we need to fix money. And yes. then while I was writing Life After the State, Bitcoin came along. So I wrote Bitcoin, The Future of Money. And, you know, I, there's a whole chapter in there called Why Bitcoin is Enemy of the State. Yeah. You know, this is the power of independent money. And the next stage, and I'm sure many of your readers will go through, and maybe you will as well, on the journey is is taxation. And as we said, you know, there's a crossover in the Venn diagram, but it's the next it's it's money and tax. Yeah. What what was your discovery of the evils of fiat? Because you know it's funny. I discovered it in the same year. Two thousand. You said two thousand five. That's right when I I fell down the central banking rabbit hole thanks to the creature from Jekyll Island. Oh yeah. Yeah. I met him. What's his name again? Um, G. Edward Griffin. Yeah, Edward. Yeah, Edward G. Griffin. I met him yeah. in. Um, Mexico in a An Acapulco. If you've ever been to that conference, I met him one time. Oh, nice. And, um, I'd made some money. I was looking around at what to invest in. People were talking about gold. I started reading about gold. I read a book called by James Turk, who is a hero called the coming collapse of the dollar. Mm. And it, immediately it was like the american civil war thing it was one of those once you you see it you're like oh and suddenly so many things to do with the economy first and foremost why house prices cost such a ridiculous amount of money right. relative to what people earn suddenly i understood it and then it's 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 your blue pill or your red pill or your orange pill or your gold right. pill moment i don't even know what color the pill is <laughs> I've lost track, but anyway, it's the pill moment. And, um, and, and I had one of those pill moments with, with money and I had, I had it with tax and I hope I have it with something else. Well, maybe I don't, but you know, yeah, so well, that was, that was it, that, that book gold and, and house prices. Yeah. I just think what high house prices have done to the young. I just think it's like Bitcoin's their revenge because yes. old people, Stand it, but what high house prices have done to the young is terrible. No, and it's caught, you know, contributing to homelessness, frankly. Oh. Like, there's a one of my good friends, actually, he has this, he's a super wealthy guy, went to Harvard, whatever, whatever. Um, but he has this quote that he shared with me. He said that some of the best views in the world are wasted on the rich. And what he meant by that is that there are these homes giant palatial mansion like homes all over like you know the california coast and new york and they sit empty nine ten months out of the year like rich people are the upper 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 echelon of wealth to protect themselves from inflation they're just buying these houses that sit empty mm. they, and they're so rich they don't want to rent them out half the time they just want their stuff in there and there's and so i mean that's clearly about that's not causing homelessness rate. We What's need that? to. Tot up, I said they talk about Bitcoin energy waste. We need to tot up all the empty hem homes around the world and all the energy that went into building them, and then yeah. ban empty homes. I'm not calling for that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but like, so that's like the way upper echelon, and then you could imagine how it's just increasing home prices at a lower level and just contributing mm. to homelessness, frankly. So it's really awful. Yeah, and they cost so it costs so little money to build a house. Yeah. You can build a house for like 50 grand. Yeah. Get an Ikea house. You know, anyway. 50 grand on a fiat standard. I wonder what it will be on a Bitcoin standard. We're just going to 3D print our houses. They're, print, they're, they're 3D printing houses in China for 10 grand a pot. It's probably cheaper now. 
like five years ago, it was 10 grand a pop. So I dread to think what they are now. Yeah, it's incredible.